good morning, good noon, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you're joining in from. But thank you for um, joining us for this Caravan Story Project webinar. Um, really, you know, it's a, it's not a lecture. It's really a presentation. Um, so the structure will really be a presentation with Rajiv and, and Darjane, and I'll let them introduce themselves as well. But you know, feel free to drop your questions in chat. We'll keep track of them. Or, you know, just feel free to jump in as, as you'll see through the presentation. It's it's not a lecture or anything like that. It's really a discussion about um, DEI. And with that being said, I'll pass it over to Rajiv um, and Darjane, which who will be facilitating our, our our discussion today. So, thank you all for joining us, and Rajiv, I'll pass it over to you. Okay, uh, he passed it to Rajiv, but I'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everyone. Um, again, my name is Darjane. I am the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Manager um, at Walden Family Services. And um, I'm happy to be on this uh, webinar with you all to discuss the importance of um, DEI and what it is in the solutions for small and medium nonprofit organizations. Um, at Walden, you know, this is a brand new role that we started um, this year in April. And um, so far, it's just been a really, really um, great journey just experiencing, um, you know, the, the impact that it's had on the organization and, you know, some of the um, hurdles that we are going through and um, trying to get over. Um, and so, you know, we're going to have a great conversation today about it. And, um, you know, I look forward to diving more into the conversation. And I would now like to introduce Rajiv. Uh, Desai. Thanks so much, Darjane. Uh, so great to see, see all of you on the screen here. Um, thank you for dialing in. Um, so my name is Rajiv Desai. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, I live in Washington, D.C., and over the past year, um, I founded my own uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting practice, primarily focusing on small and medium-sized enterprises for and not-for-profit. And the reason I chose this journey is because uh, in the in my prior DEI careers, both in-house as the head of DEI at Gartner, but also client facing with Fortune 500 companies at CEB uh, in the diversity and inclusion space, I, I, it quickly dawned on me that the reason why so many larger organizations are struggling with this work is because they just didn't start early enough. Um, you know, as you get much larger, it's hard to put new processes in place. It's hard to treat existing processes. And let's face it, it's really hard to change human behaviors, right? And so I think the smaller you are, the more nimble you are. I, as, as daunting as it sounds, I think that's the right time to think about DNI, even if it means doing one or two things in a given year. Um, and so I'm really excited to you know, bring this topic together here with Darjane, who's going to bring some fabulous experiences from her world as well. Uh, and let's just have a really fun conversation. Um, we will be doing a little bit of active polling just to kind of get some insights from all of you. Um, and definitely let's keep the conversation going in the chat as well. Uh, this is not meant to be, you know, Darjane and me kind of talking at you for the next one and a half hours. We can have a really good conversation about this. Uh, and if you really have a burning question, feel free to use the raise hand feature. Um, you know, if we see, if I see you on the grid very easily, we'll definitely pause for that question as well. Um, so yeah, with that, we can get go ahead and get started. Um, Darjane, do you want to add anything before we kick off? No, that sounds great. I'll go ahead and jump into the uh, <laughs> first question. Sure. Yeah. All right, cool. Okay, so um, at a high level, what are you seeing as key trends and important developments in the DEI world? So sure. like the C-suite board, leadership trends, like overall, like what are you seeing? Yeah, it's, it's such a great question to just kind of pause and start with that one, right? Because I think it's, it, it's coming to us from all sides, right? And I think it's, it's always interesting to see how this topic and body of work has truly kind of grown and manifested over the, not even the last year, but just the last 15, 20 years, you know, and every country, every region has their own nuances of how this body of work has grown, uh, both internally and externally. So I'll just quickly share some high level trends that I'm seeing in the last year or two. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm seeing some really good comments in the chat pod already, so thank you for that. Um, but before I dive in, I do want to start with one quick polling question. And so Bradley, could you uh, pull up the first poll around uh, responsibility for DEI? Yes. I'd love for everyone to kind of chime in with their responses. And many of you can probably already guess where I'm going with that question. Um, and as he pulls it up, I'll read the question out. Um, 
you know, at to what level do you agree that diversity, equity, and inclusion is the primary responsibility of HR only, or HR is primarily responsible for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion? So we're having um, a little bit of technical difficulties. Okay, because... No worries. We can come but, back to that yeah. one in a second. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll park that one on the side for a second. Um, the other um, kind of interesting trend I'm seeing is uh, DEI is not just now living in its own little siloed world around whether it be you know, your EEO compliance or your internal data reporting. It's really truly manifesting itself across everything else that organizations are doing as well, whether it be your programmatic efforts of the of the constituents that you're serving to the nonprofit. If you're in the for-profit world, it's kind of trickling into the ESG, environmental social governance side of the house. Um, it's really kind of becoming an all-encompassing body of work that has its uh, relationships to other parts of the organization as well. If you are serving you know, uh, marginalized populations, if you're doing any form of work around equity, you know, it, it's really making its way into uh, all elements of the work that organizations are doing. Um, the other piece that has very quickly come up in the last, you know, five or six years is um, before there was a lot of focus of just kind of um, amplifying the diversity of the numbers of your organization. And what that typically meant was uh, let's get better at hiring more people from diverse backgrounds at the lower rungs, because that's where you have the more, more of the hiring happening if you're a slightly larger organization. Um, very quickly, we're now looking at a lot of focus, demand, and excitement around getting better at diversity at higher levels as well. So leadership, board, C-suite, um, it's people want to see role models in the, in the board. They want to see role models in the C-suite. And so, and that gets much harder because there are only that many positions. And that's always a question of experience versus succession planning versus, you know, uh, how do we find that talent? So, but, but that focus on leadership is definitely coming up a lot. Uh, around it, uh, itself as well. The other thing that we saw a lot in the last three to four years, but it really quadrupled or even you know five times the amount of uh, efforts was last year uh, in hiring dedicated support for DEI. Right now, that could be uh, you know a part time head, a full time head, a consultant who can help you get started, uh, the HR manager formally taking on you know DEI as a, as a half time role. Uh, whatever that looked like, we saw a proliferation of that role uh, growing. And I think the chief diversity officer role is now one of the most you know, in-demand roles that are out there. Um, and sadly, that was a lot because of the, the murder of George Floyd last year, right? We literally saw that as the turning point uh, for, and it should not have taken that long to make that change happen, right? And so, but it did. Um, so that's the other big trend I'm seeing. Um, and then for some of you that are in, in a more of a global nonprofit, uh, even if you're a smaller nonprofit, we're seeing a lot of global conversations around this, right? So DEI is not just a US topic. Uh, sometimes we make the mistake of applying our US centric DEI norms on the on the rest of the world, but it doesn't always manifest itself beautifully uh, in those markets. So if you have you know contractors, uh, field agents in other countries or uh, other cultures um, know that you know there is a different way to um, uh, you know, uh, bring that conversation into your the, uh, strategy itself. So it sounds like the polling is now working, correct, Bradley? And before, yes, we, and before we get to that, we had a question. Um, Natalie had her hand raised um, with the before we get to the polling. I wanted to, you know, address Natalie really quickly. Sure. Go ahead. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. I've done a lot of research on diversity in helping people of color and LGBTQ find their way into the workforce and have more opportunity. One thing I feel I'm not seeing enough of in the research is people with disabilities. And there's a very long history of stigma against people with multiple disabilities. And I'm wondering, are you taking the disability into, into consideration when doing your research? That's a fantastic question, Natalie. And actually, that was my second to last bullet point around these trends. Um, and I can quickly jump to that. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is um, taking a more pan-diversity approach to the work, right? Uh, and even though the numbers are not there, the data may not be there, people are really questioning to say, why are we spending six years just solving for gender? Why are we now looking at race and ethnicity? And this, there seems to be this weird 
pecking order, right? Like let's focus on gender first, then let's look at race and ethnicity. And a lot of it had to do with the data we had historically, right? So EEO reporting, affirmative action reporting was predominantly gender globally and race and ethnicity in the US, right? We, disability numbers were captured, but not shared. Uh, you know, veteran status was captured, but not oftentimes used as, as a way to advance the work. LGBTQ data is still not captured, you know, in, in, a, co in a cohesive manner. And so the, the, the rhetoric has really changed around, okay, even if we don't have the data, what can we do to close some of the equity barriers, right? Um, people with disabilities, not just a lot of times what companies and organizations are doing is they're really looking at, um, you know, physical disabilities or visible disabilities, right? Oh yeah, we're doing great. We have a wheelchair ramp, our doors open with a button, you know, we have all these things, but th there has to be a way of looking at your broader holistic uh, population and saying, okay, what do they need? And creating that culture of being able to say, I need this to get my job done, please give it to me, right? And that could be technology, that could be uh, you know, changing the way you do a Zoom call. It could be really small things that make it more inclusive, but managers and leaders have to pause and, and do that. So I absolutely agree with you. I think, you know, we waited too long on that topic and we oftentimes brush it off as, oh, that's already covered under OSHA or that's already covered under building facilities management, but that's only one small piece of the puzzle, right? So, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, thank you. Okay, I'd like to add at Walden, we are actually um, going to start up, you know, working with neurodiverse talents um, and bring them into training our hiring managers um, into looking at how um, they can benefit our organization um, and working with our population of our uh, transgender, our transitional housing youth and our foster care families. Um, and so we actually are um, bringing that to the forefront um, because of the type of population that we serve, and we know that they are a benefit to our organizations. So thank you for that comment. Um, Bradley, did you want to go ahead and launch the poll for us? Yeah, I'll go ahead and launch it. Great. So once again, if you all can see the poll on your screen, um, uh, and those that may be dialing from the phone as well, uh, you may, uh, I don't know if you can actually click on it, but the question says, HR is primarily responsible and accountable for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So feel free to uh, select your option, either strongly agree, agree, neither agree or disagree, which is which is my least favorite answer, but it's always there as an option. Uh, disagree and then strongly disagree. Give it a quick second here to get the answers in. Bradley, if you can see a, a good amount of responses, feel free to share, show us the results or just announce them. Yeah. Um, so we have 93% participated, so I think that's good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we have 3% of people strongly agree, 26% of people agree, 3% neither agree nor disagree, 45% of people disagree, and 23% of people strongly disagree. So I would say the majority of people either disagree or strongly disagree. Great, thank you for sharing that. Um, and so I will caveat by saying that because all of you are here for this webinar, you obviously have a, you know, a much more heightened interest in diversity, equity, and inclusion. So the answers could be a little bit more skewed as opposed to asking the more general population in our workforces. Um, that said, I will say I did this poll with a similar audience um, on the for-profit side of the house earlier this year in January. And the numbers are far higher here to say we disagree that HR is primarily responsible, right? So clearly the tides are turning, you know, the awareness is far more uh, amplified that it's not just HR's job to quote unquote fix DEI. Um, it has to be more of a pan organization effort uh, around this, uh, this topic itself. So um, Darjan, anything to add to that in terms of the data itself from your experience? Um, I, I would absolutely agree, you know, one, one silo of the organization cannot do all of the work, right? Um, and it has to be uh, across multiple um, departments, multiple entities in the organization to push the work forward. Um, and so we, I can definitely tell the difference. Um, I just was having a conversation the other day with one of my colleagues where they did not have the support from their senior leadership team. And, and you can tell the difference when it's you get pushback and resistance um, when it is not across the board and who want to um, push the organization forward with utilizing the diversity, equity, and inclusion um, tenants. Yeah, 100%. And the other caveat I'll add to this um, is, you know, at least in some of the medium to larger organizations, 
as much as we always say HR is there for its people, HR has to play a double role of protecting the organization as well, right? And that typically is at odds with moving the dial on some DEI efforts, whether it be, you know, changing behaviors, changing, uh, you know, implementing a cost for, for a new project or changing the way you hire. And so that's another reason why it cannot just be HR driving it because it's almost, you almost have like an independence issue, right? Um, they want to protect the business, but they also want to protect the talent. And how do you find that balance, uh, you know, is really tricky. And so therefore, you know, more and more, we, we want to say that DEI should be an uh, enterprise-wide uh, responsibility and not just HR itself. Absolutely. Um, let's go ahead with the second poll, um, Bradley, uh, which is around CEO and board accountability. So here the question is, should CEOs and boards be held accountable uh, for DEI outcomes? And the keyword here is accountable. Um, so feel free to go ahead and select your options from strongly agree to strongly disagree. Bradley, let us know when you reach a good percentage of participation. Okay, we have uh, well, ninety percent participated, so um, I'll go ahead and end the poll and yeah, hear the results. But you can see that the majority of people ag agree with that statement. Right. So this is incredible. Uh, again, we are a bit of a biased population here, but to see sixty percent in the strongly agree again is a big shift from just earlier in the year. Um, and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions and comments on this one, um, because what we've seen a lot is, you know, boards and C CEOs and leadership teams always saying, yes, this is great. We need to do more of this. Let's get it done. But the moment it means, you know, are you going to be held accountable for it? That's where you get a lot of pushback. Um, so just this is a topic that I think has a lot of different ways it can resonate amongst organizations. Does anybody want to chime in around if, if they've had this conversation? Um, if you are a CEO, what does that conversation look like for you? Um, if you are on the board member, you know, what has this been for you? Just, just curious and we'll give it a quick pause here. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Taha. I'm not a CEO or a chairperson on any board, but I have worked with boards here in Canada. And what I've seen is that a lot of the times, each and every member of the board can be very active in the DEI space and very vocal uh, in their own personal circles. But when you look at their organization and the work that is le led by their organization, there's a complete dissonance between who they are as a person outside of the organization and what are the impacts of their organization on this matter. So for someone who might be like, you know, leading movements outside of their role as a board member, their uh, own organization might not even have any structure or processes built to support their staff or to support their work through a DEI lens. So I've seen that a lot of the times when I come into a board and I try to like work with them, um, they already tell me how fantastic they are as individuals, but yeah. they don't have, they don't actually take the time to reflect on a oh, great, <laughs> does that also speak to the work that you have and the structures that you put and the systems that your work is bathing in, you know? 100%. Thank you, Taharima. Um, Deanne, did I see your hand going up as well? Go ahead. Yes, uh, just a comment uh, and a question. Um, I, uh, in, the, in the chat, uh, there was a comment by Nick, and I thought that was interesting because, um, you know, uh, comparing uh, DEI skills with professional skills, and, you know, sometime back um, in the medical profession, they started to do training as far as, um, you know, uh, interpersonal skills with, with patients. And uh, I, I'm a retired engineer, so I look at things from, from that standpoint. And, and I wonder why we can't include a bit of the interpersonal part and the DEI part with more professional, dis other professional disciplines. That's a fantastic question. Um, Nick, since you are on the line, did you want to reflect? Uh, sorry to put you on the spot, but if not, I can, I can go ahead as well. No, you're fine. Um, no, I just threw that out because I think we, so many people who enter into a DEI role or who are given DEI bullet points in their HR position description, they receive them because they're passionate 
about racial justice. They write, they can write a good Facebook post. And I often find that those people are the ones who maybe do the most harm because they're walking into situations, they're unequipped, they don't know how to train, they don't know how to lead, they don't know what empathy building looks like or psychological safety building looks like. Like DEI is a real field of study. This is a real discipline. And leaders don't recognize that. So they just hand it off to Sarah, who loves to talk about Black Lives Matter. And it's like, no, that's not enough. So thank you, Nick. Um, yeah, 100%. And then just to add to that, we saw a lot of this last year. So because of uh, the sudden influx of uh, DEI roles, the market was not ready to provide that talent. So uh, organizations were not only trying to hire for, you know, they, they wanted a chief diversity officer, but they wanted to pay at the manager level, right? They wanted to uh, bring in a consultant, but they only wanted to pay, you know, $5,000 or, you know, whatever. There was a big gap in, in skills versus demand. And so what we saw is a lot of people were getting promoted from within uh, the organization to take on this DNI role simply because they represented a specific identity, right? And we, uh, if you look, if you click on it, half of these roles on LinkedIn, you'll see they're currently director of DEI and their past 15 jobs have nothing to do with diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? It's just their photo that has the correlation to their title, right? And so we saw a lot of that last year. And then in, to add to that, to Nick's point, you know, a lot of DEI is about change management, uh, you know, um, communication about uh, stakeholder management. And if you want to truly embed DEI into every aspect of the organization, you have to know their world as well, right? So how do those processes work? How does a marketing process work? How do you create photos and brands? So I think that level of agility and that level of process mapping is also a skill. And then the last thing I'll say, Deanne, to your point is, Yes, I 100% believe that DEI skill building, competency building should be woven into your existing training as well, right? So you can't have new manager training for two days in the beginning of your manager job, and then six months later, you get a unconscious bias training, right? Like those two should be smooshed together, right? Because as you are learning how to be a good manager, you need to know what role bias plays in that, in that role itself. So I think we've answered this question in a few different ways, but suffice to say, I think, you know, it's, it's a strong body of work that needs dedicated support. Um, and there's a way to um, embed that into the organization itself. Um, Darjani, anything to add from your side? Um, I would say that we are doing um, a lot of that. We're starting to do a lot of that now with our um, uh, managers, high, uh, program directors. Um, I, I've come from um, education. So um, in education, we had that embedded in a lot of the things that we do. I mean, I know there is a big to do with critical race theory right now in education, um, and that's and that's part of it, right? It's taught in higher ed. It's taught how uh, we teach our teachers to think critically about how we present um, different topics outside of just the white um, dominant norm. But we but we embed that um, in our teaching strategies. So to Deanne's point, yes, I see why can't we incorporate that in the studies as people are training to be engineers or becoming architects or doing that across the field. Um, and I think that that's starting to, going to be happening. Um, the trend is going to start happening in higher ed across the board, not in just silos and specific subjects. Um, and uh, for at Walden, we are starting to, um, in the next year, looking at how we can do better training around this to, to support our leaders, to support our management, um, and to um, acknowledge you know, where they are and to support where they are and to help them move forward. Um, was there any other hands raised uh, before we moved on? Anybody else wanted to jump in on that? Okay. All right. Great. The, the, the two, just the last two pieces I wanted to cover on this broader topic of trends, and I'm loving this discussion because it's gonna set the stage for some of the other questions. Um, the other big piece that is really driving this body of work now is uh, the, the, the notion of employee activism, right? Employees are truly holding their organizations um, responsible and, and you know, they want to hold them accountable for taking up more of a stance. And I think this would be even more prevalent in the nonprofit space because you know, by nature, we're all doing good in the nonprofit space and we want to do better at you know, being better stewards of of DEI, so the the kind of the the grassroots level activism happening in organizations is really really uh, strong now, and I think that's going to create uh, you know a lot more demand for this work. Uh, and I think the earlier organizations can get ahead of it, the better it is for everyone. Um, let's do the last poll real quick, uh, Bradley, uh, around and and this one I'm really curious about, especially from from y'all's lens. Uh, 
Uh, and this is about uh, the reputation of diversity, equity, and inclusion in your industry, so in the nonprofit world. So don't worry about the specific areas of the nonprofit, whether it's education, healthcare, you know, human services, is more all nonprofits. Um, you know, how do you feel about the reputation of how well you all are doing in DEI as, a, in, as an industry uh, or as, as a segment uh, on a scale of 10 to 1, um, 10 being really good, 1 being really bad? Are we gonna hit ninety percent again, Bradley? We're at eighty percent. I'll give it a yeah. That <laughs> clearly we're getting into survey fatigue, so we're not. This is the last. <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead and uh, yeah. I'll go ahead and end it and share the results. It seems we're kind of sticking towards the the middle. Okay, so we have a, on there. Very, yeah, and and this one I would I would expect something like this simply because you know. We, we, we are in our own sectors and our own segments and we may not have that kind of global view across the US even, um, but um, any kind of qualitative remarks on this um, from, from the audience on, on the line here around you know, your DEI reputation in the nonprofit space? Go ahead. I would say it, it varies dependent, dependent upon which constituency you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. What I've seen uh, as far as women, yes. Um, as, as far as uh, black folks, eh, not too bad. As far as transgender folks, eh, not at all. So it, it you know, I, I, my reply was, you know, kind of a, a mental averaging of those. Thank you. Natalie, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I feel it's also not very good. And I admit, I, I've been guilty of it when I first launched my organization, when I was first finding board members to come and take part, because my um, my topic is a little more of a stigma. I help people with epilepsy. And because a lot of people don't understand it, it's challenging to find people to advocate for it. But when I first launched my um, organization, I was the only one, I'm well, still right now, I'm bringing two women on now, but I was the only woman on the board. And here were five of us at 1.6 and it just didn't look good. And it wasn't one thing I brought up to my um, board this year was, you know, as we grow long-term, me being surrounded by a bunch of guys and not having much diversity, who's going to want to become a corporate sponsor? Who's going to want to invest long-term if we don't bring some diversification, bring people of all kinds into our organization and strengthen it. But I have to say, starting, I found it to be such a big challenge in trying to diversify my board. Thank you. Um, we had a comment in the uh, chat box by Ellen. And she's, excuse me, Ellen said that it looks different at the board level than the staff level. And so that, that poll probably would look very different um, had we pulled the different demographics um, yeah. that we have today. So that, and that actually reminds me of this conversation I had a few months ago with um, someone about, you know, I, we see so many nonprofits where the leadership looks so different from the end constituents that they serve, right? Yeah. And the answer I always get is, well, the people that donate to the organization as large grants or large funds, they're similar to the leadership in terms of where they're from, their backgrounds, their race, genders, who have you. And therefore this notion of human behaviors where we give to the people that, that look like us, right? And therefore leadership tends to be so, and because I, I don't work in the nonprofit space, I do only sit on the board of one of them. I would love to hear your perspectives about how is that gonna change or not change and what, what impact does that have on, on your DEI initiatives? Um, for anyone who may agree with that, that um, observation. I think it's very true because I found with my larger competitors, it's a lot of business people, attorneys, you know, and back, that background, which in one way I understand it because you're looking for people with education and leadership. One thing I focused on in building my um, board, I've insisted with my board members to bring a few people on who do have epilepsy, who are able to take part in this. And the main reason for that is if I'm the only person on the board with this condition in a leadership position, people are going to wonder, you know, 
do, do, am I connecting the community? Am I really giving the community opportunity to advocate? And I think in a lot of these larger organizations, at least my personal experience, they really don't take people who are dealing with the condition seriously. It's okay, it looks good that we're helping them or we're researching to find a cure, but trying to bring the community in to have a say. They, I can't tell you how many walls I faced to the point where I said, you know what, I'm just going to have my own organization if I can't communicate with these larger ones. And I think that's a very big issue. Thank you. Um, Lena? Hi, I'm sorry. I had a, a bit of a challenge with my reactions there. Um, Lena Paredes, I'm with a foundation called the Guillermo J. Valenzuela Foundation in the Inland Empire. And I am uh, the vice chair of the Inland Empire Funders Alliance. And as the name suggests, it's a group of funders. And I just wanted to respond to your question, Rajiv, about um, you know funders looking like um, uh, the leaders of nonprofit organizations and um, them being white. I can't say this for the entire country, but I know in California, we have a very strong trend towards uh, leaders of color in, uh, in mm -hmm. philanthropy. And um, philanthropy, um, I think that, you know, um, philanthropy that is trying to uh, really come from a social justice and equity lens is really trying to do its part to encourage and support DEI um, efforts um, at the nonprofit level and to, um, you know, in, in particular in, in some of the um, uh, examples or experiences I've had to actually implement DEI in our own institutions as well. So um, we um, and we try to influence the nonprofits uh, to the best of our ability in this direction as well. So the other thing I want to say is, you know, when organizations say, well, we want to diversify our boards, um, a lot, you know, I hear this just incredibly frustrating comment. Well, how do I ask somebody to be on my board just because they're a person of color? And you know, my, my response is you don't ask them to be on your board because just because they're a person of color. They have talents and skills and, and experience because of who they are, because of um, their backgrounds that, um, that you need to investigate as being potential assets to your organization as well. So, um, you know, we want to stay away from tokenism and really bring people who can contribute to our organizations at all levels of leadership. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I really appreciate that comment because, you know, that's kind of what we're, you know, having to struggle around as well with philanthropy and, and the grants and the donations um, around that topic specifically. So appreciate that. Um, Sharon? Hi, I'm director of development for NAMI uh, in here in Austin, Texas, where uh, with, around mental health. And I have to tell you, perhaps it is our uh, what we do our, uh, with mental health, because as we know, that has no boundaries for age, uh, community, anything like that. And that's just part of our messaging. So I have found that I'm not having any sort of uh, problem getting to, uh, when I ask people if they would like to be on the board, or they'd like to help or to donate in terms of um, uh, diversity. I will tell you that right now we're still pretty much, we are pretty much serving white upper middle class right now, but uh, it's very much with mental health that it's everybody. So uh, messaging has really helped us get that through and I, we're not seeing any, uh, I'm not seeing any sort of a problem there, so. Thank you for sharing Thank you. that. Anyone else? I'm loving the discussion here. Okay. Um, can, can, can I add, Raji? Sure, go ahead, John. The, the other thing that I've found sometimes, um, people in the community don't know how to connect with the boards either. They don't, they're not prepared. They, they don't really feel like they would qualify for board service. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to help people 
better understand that, you know, you don't have to have these special qualifications. You are special as you are right. and that you can come and we really want what you are bringing to us and not this preconditioned because I, you know, when I invited a few people to my board, they were like, well, I've never been on a board before. I said, well, that's good news. That means it's not, you don't have to unlearn, right? <laughs> and then, you know, it was like, um, but I don't know if I would, you know, if I'm qualified. It was kind of like, you know, you just don't understand that the people on the board are qual any more qualified than you. So I think really changing that part of the narrative is also important so that we attract or and when we recruit people, they're willing to to join the board. Hundred percent. Go ahead, Dan. The the thing that uh, strikes me is that yeah, it it is a challenge to diversify a board. I mean, that's that's a given, and and it can take a while to do that. Um, but until that happens, you have to be very particular about making sure that you connect with the constituencies and, and what's going on and try to understand that. Because if you don't have that linkage, you really have to make a point to, to discover uh, and make those contacts otherwise. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. So I, I feel like just to wrap up this little piece here, um, I feel like so much of the conversation around board leadership and board diversification now also, also happens at diversifying your C-suite and also has a little bit of a trickle down into how you hire, right? So uh, to the point made earlier about, you know, not hiring just because of their identity, we hear this so much from managers, right? Oh, I, should I just go out and hire this person because it'll affect my diversity numbers? Um, and you know the, the 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 answer is no. You that's not the only reason, right? You 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 look for the skill sets that you need, and the way you and we'll talk a little bit more about talent acquisition in a second here. But it's really more about opening up your the pool that you hire from. You know, looking at your requirements a little bit more, uh, even for your job description for your board chairs and your board roles. You know, are we unnecessarily loading it up with years and years of you know, uh, bullet points that really have little to no value of your of the board, right? It's just something that somebody put together many years ago. Um, the only other comment I want to make, and maybe it's a question, is how much of this now are you facing from your uh, external grant making organizations, your big donors? Are you getting the diversity, equity, and inclusion pressure from external sources? And I'm just curious to hear if anybody has any comments on that. And is that then driving the board to think about this more strategically? I think Mary uh, Frame might have some good, good points on that one. Um, oh, in relation to what grantees are looking for? Yeah, so increasingly yeah. we're seeing, you know, either it's in the questionnaire when you apply for a grant mm -hmm. or, you know, it, on, on GuideStar, you need to submit your board diversity numbers so you can get a better rating. Uh, so just curious about external pressures uh, to, to keep the nonprofit, uh, you know, uh, going. Yeah, I mean, we definitely see that um, in, in a lot of the grant applications. And, um, and like you said, people are asking for the information. Um, and I, I guess my thing is, I don't know that that always translates to the most positive reason to make this kind of change. Sure. Um, or the most genuine reason to make yeah. this kind of change. Oh, 100%. Yeah. So, I think they think that they're being helpful and promoting, and it doesn't always um, have the effect they want. Yeah. Oh, hundred. I'm so glad you said that because for me, external compliance, governmental regulations, EU reporting, as much as it can possibly drive some level of change, uh, we do it because we have to. But this body of work is so much more than that. It's about doing the right things. And then that part will become easier once you focus on this in a more holistic way, right? Otherwise, you're constantly chasing regulations. And you know, next thing you know, one county will say, now you need this numbers, and now you've got to start this project. Mm -hmm. That that chase is very annoying. So you don't want to get and, into that place. So um, for Walden, I do quality assurance. So I do a, and I do a lot of the data collection. And I think that was a perfect example, you know. You had to do the EOC form. Okay, I can help you be compliant with it, 
Now you have the information. Do you think there was any discussion about what to do with it? No. Right. Um, but then I think through bringing on, uh, I mean, Darjan has been a great help to us to be able to take that compliance requirement and actually then figure out how to utilize it to implement real change in information in our organization. And if you don't have someone championing that, the compliance isn't going to get you where they want you to go. 100%. It's what I always jokingly tell my clients, right? It's uh, you can tell me how much I weigh on the weighing scale, but if you don't tell me how to get healthier, that's not going to help me, right? I'll just keep getting the same number over and over again. Yes. Right? I need to know everything else about that number. So yeah. Yeah. having a chart over time of that number doesn't help you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Lena? I just want to add to that that um, and you know as a funder I like to think that some external pressure can be helpful <laughs> biased <laughs> for sure um, but I think um, what I what I like to do and I've worked on both sides of the equation is if a funder is bringing it to a nonprofit's attention I like to think that there are staff members in the nonprofit um, as you say, who are activist oriented, who will be like, oh, look, you know, they want this from us and use it as an opportunity to um, leverage moving their own organizations. Yeah. I agree. External uh, pressure can be a great change catalyst, um, but if we just stop with that, that's not going to help us, right? So we use that as a way to trigger the fire and then start the body of work. Um, so many clients and companies are just sitting on the fact that they've scored 100% on the Human Rights Campaign's Equality Index, right, for LGBTQ equality. And that's great. It's a good starting point, right? But those indices don't move as fast as we want to. So, you know, trans inclusion is still an issue in the workplace. You know, um, the, many, com many companies still don't have the basic provisions. But just because that question doesn't cover it doesn't mean we, should be doing, we shouldn't be doing it, right? And so... Uh, I think it's a good pressure, but it should not be the only way to do this work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So just moving a touch along, um, Darjani, shall we move to the next section? Sure. Absolutely. So for smaller and mid-sized organizations, how should they go about organizing or even thinking about their efforts, especially in the tight talent environment? So um, as we, you know, move through this conversation, we're now we're going to look specifically into workforce, workplace and like marketplace structure. Yeah, so this is I love having this discussion because it, it, it takes us away a little bit from some of the uh, ways that organizations have started doing DEI work, which is always, oh, we need the diversity. We need the numbers. Let's go higher. Right. Uh, and then now we often find times find ourselves in places, especially for small organizations, um, oh, we don't have that many open roles. So how do we inflect that, inflect that diversity numbers, right? And then it all kind of come stalls, right? Because it's like, oh, we can't do one piece, so therefore we can't do the rest of the work. Um, so before I get into this section, um, would love to hear, has anybody kind of holistically, you know, started their DEI work? Are they, you know, how, how are you organizing your DEI strategy or your pieces? Um, it can be a high level response to say, here are the five things we focus on, but curious to know from you all, um, you know, how have you approached the, this, this uh, amazing body of work in your organization? Or is that why everyone is here? <laughs> <laughs> I can share, um, I, can, I can share, um, hopefully get others to think about what they're doing. Um, and so, some of the things that we kind of started to um, look at is when we do, um, you know, we have our um, our anti-racist uh, statement on our job description, right? So we, um, I attended one of Caravan Sarai's webinars um, from there. They had a seed uh, partnership uh, presentation and, you know, it kind of struck me. They were like, you know, we are moving in this direction. We are anti-racist organization. We support our LGBTQ. We're welcoming and affirming. And we put it on our job descriptions. We put it straight on our job descriptions. We wanted people to know if they're going to apply to our organizations, then our organization, then this is the type of uh, people that we want to attract, right? And so we put it on our job description as um, um, how we're going to, the type of people we want to come to our organization um, and be at our organization to help push this forward. 
we started looking at our, um, you know, our how we recruited, where we recruited, the type of people we recruited. Uh, we are starting to talk about and train our hiring managers and bring in trainers for our organization um, wide, right? We we talking about being an ally, what that means, um, bringing in resources for our staff to utilize. Um, we are out there, um, you know, in the community talking about it, um, you know, so we're, we're starting to move that needle. We're starting to try to set level set and, and have a place to start so that we know where we want to uh, work towards. So those are some of the things that we were doing. And I know others out there are doing something <laughs> along those lines. Um, anybody else want to share? This is Cheryl. I can share. Hey, Cheryl. Hi. Um, we are in uh, Southern California, Los Angeles. We are located in um, an urban South LA community and our our nonprofit is not actually a church in and of itself. It's um, we're like an association of uh, churches. They pay a membership fee and then we provide contract services for different small congregations. We typically cater to storefronts mm -hmm. um, with memberships less than a hundred. So as the, we've been there for 25 years. So as the um, demographics have changed, um, our early questions when we started was around, um, where are all the black men? This was in 1995, where are they going? Well, lo and behold, they're in the prison industrial complex. That's what we discovered. So our work centered around that. And that was like our diversity, our first you know, walk into diversity inclusion. How do we include um, individuals from these with that have criminal histories that was how we that was a diversity element for us so diversity and inclusion is a gigantic definition that really starts with who shows up so for us it's the love and the faith that ties us together that's where we connect with other races genders age group sexual orientation that's where we connect where we're looking for people of faith so that's been our statement um, on our sites and our programs that really says we begin with the faith, love is for all. Okay. So that's one of our, and that's part of our mission, sharing our mission that love is for all. Doesn't mean it's perfect. So that's one thing that we do. We use our mission to find something that could be central to whatever your cause and purpose and passion. We didn't wanna leave anyone out. We didn't wanna be too small. The second hurdle for us started coming after 2010, and we realized now we're asking, where are the youth? Nobody wants to go to church anymore. People are not Christian. These young black people don't, everybody doesn't want to do that anymore. And so how do we get them engaged? Um, so that became our next issue and engaging those individuals 13 to 30 uh, African-American, because we serve, African-American churches, African-American populations. And in Los Angeles for the past 25 years, that's been a tough mission statement to hold, yeah. to hold the line. Because there is a call for racial diversity, but we experience racial disparities greater than anyone else. So we were always able to still make the case because the science, the numbers add up and I would force funders and corporate allies, look at the data. This isn't about what we feel. Look at the data. The data says we can say this with integrity because the data supports it. So that was another thing. We constantly revisited the relevance of our racial focus and made sure that organizationally, community-wide, at least our community, that we continue to look at that data um, with an eye that will be open to whatever it tells us. We're not gonna engineer diversity. It's impossible. It's one of those things that's hard to measure. I don't know how these institutions you're talking about measure so that's why i was listening like how do they actually it's something that's hard to measure so we started with that and this led us to our work today our covert response included youth ambassadors to help message to young kids of color get the shot yeah. you're worth the shot 
find the shot. He wants the shot. And so having that talk, the young people informed us in 2020, if you want to have more young people, you're going to have to pick up the LGBTQ agenda. You're going to have to get in touch because Black kids are into that. And oh my God, I'm 50 years old. So we were, my hair blew back. Can you imagine my braids going like this? It blew back. I said, what? And I said, yeah, Michelle, if you want the young people, you're going to have to find a way because we're all, all of that now. They're not so traditional and hiding in the closet. So it was, it became an education campaign. So now our customers for diversity and inclusion was not external. It wasn't our funders and our donors. It was to our base building. So how do we mobilize our base um, to be supportive of that because once they understand you know the way our methodology works everyone else that wants to be with us they'll get it too so we did that and it's and surprisingly it's going well um our core anchor christian churches are opening their minds i'm not i don't want to exaggerate like everybody's all there but it's, it's not hostile which at some phases in this diversity inclusion equity transition it was hostile these conversations, they were uncomfortable. It was awkward. Yeah. It was even downright painful for some people. We had tears and all that. I'm just, I don't want to get into any stories or names, but they didn't want to budge. So um, it's a slow process. That's the, the next thing I'll say to you for us. It was yeah. the youth that influenced us as adults. It was um, having to message to our base first before we could talk to people outside of us, if I convince, convince my family, then a stranger is no problem, right? Because we took the position, show me what you're working with. It's easy to talk to people that think like you. Your real talent and skill is going to come when you can do something that people don't know who the hell you are and why should I care? If you can move that needle, then we knew we had, we're building capacity, as they say, so... That's that's what we're doing in LA, and it's it's going pretty good. I love these kids now; they're so smart. And um, it's not about the the fear that I think our churches and our pastors had. Nobody's trying to have sex with you, pastor. So whoever they're having sex with, why do we care? <laughs> they're not coming for you. So once we had these like little frank conversations, that that helped, and um, we're solving problems now. You know, we're getting people to vaccine. We're helping people with housing. We're helping kids get into college and things like that, that they need more so than us talking to them. And that relationship allows some of these shared values to come out. So I think it's possible. And if we could do it as little grassroots, yeah. you know, Reverend Chicken Wing, you know, we don't have prestigious donors. We don't have rich people in our networks. We don't have those kind of sponsors. We're just everyday people doing a life of service because that's what we choose to do. So thank you for letting me say that. Thank you. Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl. Beautiful. <laughs> that um, was, and there's so much truth in what you said about the the church and, you know, absorbing the, with the um, LGBTQ community. There was so much truth in that. Um, yes, Rajiv, you got to say Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to add, so Cheryl, you, you actually amplified three, I, I picked up three, more than three, but I'll say three that I actually kind of nuancedly picked up from that. Uh, which actually ties in beautifully with what I wanted to say next. And, and um, Sharon, I see your hand. I'll come to you in a second. Um, you know, the, the, the first thing you talked about was the, the other kind of external pressure, right? Which is your end constituents that you serve, right? That world keeps changing. Our work keeps changing. We see so many companies embodying diversity, equity, and inclusion work because their customer base has radically changed or their product is no longer, you know, a viable product or their end group is just no longer what they initially embarked on. So that's one piece of it. Um, the second piece that I love that you touched upon was the intersectionality of, uh, you know, religion, sexual identity, sexual orientation, gender, all of those nuances of, you know, um, how we were not just one monolith of an, of an identity, we have multiple facets to ourselves, and what that caused for you all as a learning journey, right, you and your leadership team, what it meant in terms of we, we learned about these youth, we find them amazing and, and invigorating, uh, and a lot of leaders are going through that journey, right? They're learning about that from their own employees. They're learning about the, the triple hardship that comes with being from triple different identities, 
um, right? If you're just, if you're a, you know, X and then you've an X plus Y, the, the compounding effect of those two identities can be really hard. Um, and I think all of that needs to be woven into broader DEI work, right? And again, start small, start slow, but we need to keep that front and center. So I just wanted to add to that. Um, Sharon, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, when we decided to grow our board uh, about two years ago, and we had the metrics of what we needed, but when it came down, and I'd like to get your opinion about this, if we should continue this actually, but when it came down to say we were looking, we need a legal advice or something, and it would come down to two different people, then we would look at, uh, I don't want to say other things they could offer us, because that's not what I mean, but we almost uh, intentionally went out and looked into the different communities where we needed to have expansion into them to see if they were involved in those communities and could help us. So I have to say that sometimes that was a deciding factor uh, for our board was their uh, involvement in either, uh, you know, uh, if they were a person of color or LGBTQ or, or disabled, whatever. Uh, and I'd, I'd be interested later to hear what you have to say about that, because we still need to add to the board. And if that is because you know, we were you don't want token, yeah. I, 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 you know, but um, and the other thing is, I think Debbie had said she's here to learn. And we, we've started a DEI committee that has a lot of stakeholders, a staff board. Um, I, I asked a funder to be on it, on it, one of our large funders that is doing DEI work in the community, hoping they can help us. But uh, it, it, anything on what, how do you set this up? Our, our resources to, you know, we just don't want to check the box committee. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, anybody want to respond to Sharon's first question? It's okay. Y'all can tell me that whatever. It's okay. Or you can contribute in the chat too, you know, and keep that conversation going. But, yeah. Okay. Um, and then, you're, Sharon, your second question we'll definitely touch upon in terms of how do you get started? How do you get organized? Um, you know, we have about 35 minimal minutes. So, um, Darjane, can we go to the, um, so, you know, you, you talked a lot about, you um, the organizing our work. So here's the, the, the three things I'll just quickly say here is, um, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of organizations, when they first embark on this journey, um, the immediate gut reaction is to amplify the diversity element, right? Oh, we need more people of different backgrounds in our organization. How do we do that? We can't fire people. We may only need to hire people, right? And But we don't have any open roles, especially in the last two years, organizations weren't hiring, right? And so what do you do when you can't hire and, and amplify that, that the diversity, which is then the numbers side of the equation? Um, the way I've been having this conversation with my clients is, um, you know, the, the, the time to buy a fire extinguisher is not when the fire is burning. It's, you know, when there's, when things are calm, you build the processes, you make the changes, you start implementing and trying things. And then when you're ready to hire, that's not when you are trying to reinvent the wheel, right? So, um, so the way I want to explain this is, I always help my clients understand that, and this might sound very lofty, but just bear with me for a second. Um, there's the, the first column is what I call the, the workforce, right? How are you organizing your DEI efforts around the entire workforce that is in your organization? It could be five people, it could be 20 people, it could be 2,000 people. Um, and along that body of work in the workforce, I encourage all of you to sit down and just whoever is responsible for it uh, in your organization, understand what the talent life cycle looks like. How do you hire? How do you onboard? How do you bring them into the organization? How is work assigned to them? You know, is it, you know, just because we've always been doing it like that, or are you kind of, you know, building some level of inclusion in that? How are how is feedback, coaching, and performance reviews done? How is promotions done? How are bonuses paid out? Um, if you follow that entire life cycle, you will see that there are moments where things are very arbitrary, things are very, you know, based on one person's decision. And there's a lot of unconscious bias built into that, right? Now, as we all know, you can't remove unconscious bias from human behavior, but you can put checks and balances to kind of mitigate some of that, right? How do you recruit? Many people, even within the recruiting process, have said, oh, yeah, we have a, a, a diverse interview panel, right? And that's how we're going to solve for uh, recruiting. But that may be so true for the people that are actually applying for your jobs. But what about those that aren't even applying because they don't get a sense of, that this organization cares about DEI, right? A couple of years ago, there was a research done by CEB where 17% of candidates responded to say, we don't even apply for a job if we don't see visible evidence that the organization cares about DEI, right? And that could be their website, their leadership team, their social media posts. 
So right there, you've lost 17% of that, of that so-called diverse talent pool, and they're not even entering your pipeline. So you can do all the work you want in that pipeline, but you have to move this body of work for the upstream so that you can really amplify those diverse talent pools. So as you look at the employee life cycle uh, within your organization, you know, take more of a process approach, which is where that kind of process skill set comes into very handy. So your, your engineers, your operations folks, like get them involved. This is where you really want to map out that process and say, this is how we hire, retain, and advance talent within the organization. And where are those diversity and inclusion gaps from an equity lens, right? So start mapping that out. It's a lot of work, uh, don't get me wrong, but if you can start even mapping that out and making a couple of tweaks every year, your processes will grow over time as you scale as an organization itself. So that's what I call the workforce piece of it. That, that's the talent piece. That's the, uh, the, the human element of it. Um, then what I usually tell my clients is there's that middle column of uh, workplace, right? Think of this as your bucket of infrastructure. This is where all your data goes, your policies, your procedures, your office space, uh, your benefits packages, your, you know, if you're a business, if you're, uh, you know, if you have like facilities across the country to, to do your nonprofit work, like that real estate, all of that tangential infrastructure pieces that makes your organization what it is and helps your talent groups, evaluate that through a lens of equity, right? Your parental leave policy, your, um, your benefits in the office. Uh, now that many people are working from home, from a disability angle, did you make provisions for any access issues uh, from a technology perspective, right? Um, trying to close those equity gaps along the infrastructure piece Again, do one thing in one year, that's more than you would have ever done. It's a lot of work uh, to address all of those monumental pieces, but that's kind of what I park in the, in the workplace piece. Uh, that helps retain the talent that you've just spent so much time hiring from a diversity lens so that you know, when they come, in, come on board, six months later, they don't leave and you're back to square one, right? We saw this uh, rampantly in the tech industry in the Silicon Valley so many years ago, and it continues to happen because they have rushed to hire diverse talent but they didn't create the space and the infrastructure to re retain them, right? So within six months, they all left. Um, and then the last column, which I call broadly the marketplace, and all of you so uh, beautifully shared on this piece is your stakeholders, your end constituents, your communities, your grant making organizations, everybody that sits outside of your organization that has a direct impact on your organization, right? How are you sending them the message of your DEI work? Are you publishing data and reports on your website? Are you talking to them about DEI? Is it woven into all the work that you're doing with your external messaging? Uh, and believe it or not, even though I say these are three distinct columns, think of them as actually like a wheel, right? Because all that work that you do is gonna help you attract the talent because they're gonna see this, right? They're gonna see the, the messaging, they're gonna see the, active, the, the work that you're doing. Um, and so this, uh, will really help then you know, address the whole cycle. So as you map these three big areas out, together as an organization and your leadership team, figure out, you know, prioritize, okay, here are the two things you wanna do in each of those areas, and that's gonna be our, our body of work for this particular year, right? I, I completely empathize and recognize that you know, uh, we are much smaller organizations. Um, many of you may be putting this on as a, as a part-time job in addition to your full-time job. And that's why, you know, start small, start organic, but start with intentionality across the entire process. And don't just try to fix one piece of it because that's not gonna address the rest of the, uh, the, the, the process cycle, right? So I know I rambled a lot on those three big pieces, but I wanted to pause, uh, I'm sure there are questions. Uh, and then Darjan, if you feel free to chime in from your uh, experience as well. Um, I, I had a question that was posed to me on how to handle backlash from, from our, the current employees who don't typically want to subscribe to the new DEI efforts, right? Because either some are starting too late or you know where they are currently at and, and, and getting going. And then you have your, obviously the resistors to change. So um, how, how, would you, how should um, organizations handle that? Yeah, so um, if I remember correctly, uh, Professor Ron Livingston in Harvard, um, uh, he had done this research and an experiment where he, and again, don't quote me on the actual percentage, but he said a good 10 to 12% of any body of population is just not gonna be bought in, right? They're not gonna change. It's just human behavior. They, they, they don't wanna worry about this. They wanna come in, do their work and go home, right? Um, so you will have those naysayers. We all have them, right? Uh, even in our own families, you always have that one person that says, I'm not, you know, 
uh, I'm not going to support this this conversation. Um, I say let's solve for the remaining 90, right? Um, if they cross the line where they are now, you know, blatantly pro uh, adding to the lack of inclusion or you know inequitable processes, that can get into a more of a you know a disciplinary conversation. But um, I would say, you know, don't worry about that's always easy to say those 10% are going to you know, detract the work. Let's focus on the remaining 90% of the organization and, and help them move forward. Thank you. I have and, a question. Yeah. Um, can you talk about um, trust and vulnerability, particularly for the people of color? Um, or the ones that tend to be marginalized when an organization says, oh, we're gonna do this. And they've heard that story before. Yeah. And um, yeah, what, what makes this time any different? And why, why should I commit this time around? Yeah, that's a great question. So, and we saw so much of this last year, right? When commitments were made, when, when tweets were made, when social media posts were made. Um, and people are now asking, well, it's been 12 months, what have you done, right? Um, so I, I think the way, and again, would love to hear from the rest of the, the, rest of the group here. Um, I think being intentional in what you're gonna do and getting your employees on board ahead of that communication or that, that commitment is gonna be key, right? It cannot just be your head of comms or your head of you know, the leadership team just writing a tweet and sending it out. Um, get your employees on board, listen to them. We're seeing this uh, far more now than ever before. It, and it, it's trickling down into things like working from home, flexible work, you know, COVID uh, vaccine compliance. Employees are truly speaking up. And so let's get them on board instead of just talking at them about DEI. Uh, and this is kind of manifesting in different ways. Um, many smaller organizations who don't have the bandwidth to create employee resource groups, um, which many large organizations have the numbers to support, uh, are creating diversity and equity and inclusion councils, right? It could be a handful of employees who are truly representing the, bo the body of the, the population that your organization has. Um, you know, that's a great way to capture that voice, a uh, great way to kind of trickle down the communications both ways up and down. Uh, and then I say the biggest thing leaders can do is communicate, 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 but also communicate on what you're not going to do and why right? It's very easy to kind of brush off something because of cost or whatever, but your employees want to hear about it. And I think that also helps building trust. Um, so that's one piece of it. And then the second piece I'll say is um, uh, creating a more uh, transparent organization around questioning decisions, right? Why were decisions made? How did we land on this decision? This is a much loftier topic. So I know I'm saying it very easily, but um, it, if we start with this uh, behavior in let, let's quote let's say it as non DEI topics. So why were cost reductions made, or why was the decision made to you know close the office? That'll make the the conversation on the DEI topics that much easier because now you you've practiced this in areas that you're already familiar with, right? Um, so that's those are my two kind of recommendations. But uh, Darjane and rest of the group, if you have something that's working for you, uh, I'm sure the the group would love to hear. Yeah, I actually would like to, um, you know, agree with what Rajiv just said. You know, we are actually doing that. Um, when we we when I started, you know, we threw out we did a survey. Uh, we did a DNI survey. From there, we I did focus groups. So I went around to all of the employees, uh, all of the levels, um, and listened to them. And I heard them. Um, from there, we we did we created our council. Um, I shared the results with leadership. I shared the results with our council. Um, anytime that we um, come up with something at our council, I take it back to our employees. I send out a survey. I ask them for their opinion. I mean, I listen, right? I listen. Um, people come to me. They they have you know specific needs, or they ask for, um, you know, they're they're seeking for something, or they 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 actually have possible solutions. You know, we listen to that. Um, leadership takes that into consideration. I mean, this also go back goes back to the need for the support from your senior and executive leadership team to help push these um, initiatives, to help drive the change. Because if they are not in support of it, you are up in an uphill battle and very little will get done. But because I do have that support, because our organization does want to move forward in that direction, um, we are seeing positive changes and uh, we 
while there it's not a smooth road, like Raji said, it's definitely you know a slow and steady process. Um, but we are able to do these things. Um, you know, we are able to have input from our employees, even if they are not on the council because of whatever reasons, their voice still matters. And because we do send out anonymous surveys, because we do ask for their input, we are starting to get that. We are starting to see the level of involvement and engagement that we are seeking for to help um, others, you know, move forward, um, you know, help evolve the organization um, and, press, and tr and press towards our overall mission. Um, uh, being more inclusive. Um, and, you know, while we, we've always really been, Walden has really been good on diversifying their workforce, right? We've um, had high numbers, but we have identified that, you know, in social services, it's low male already. Um, but we are able to, now that we see that, um, we know that we can actually identify, like when we are recruiting for positions to keep that in our mind frame, right? And that's, and there's nothing wrong with calling out what we're looking for a lot of people say oh we just want the best qualified candidate right they just lean on best qualified candidate okay well, we can have the best qualified candidate that's a male right like they, they we can do those things right we can we can say we are looking for some a type of person or something you know to help diversify that it, it's okay to do that it, you know people are afraid like oh it's it's, it's illegal no you can, you, you can you can do that you know um and so um, we're able to identify you know the gaps we're able to start uh, refining our processes and procedures, making them more equitable. We're able to now um, have these tough conversations um, in safe environments, right? We're we're now looking at how we can create our workplace to be psychologically safe for all people, um, no matter what their background is, and acknowledging that, um, okay, we come from a specific demographic, but how can we be culturally um, humble um, to uh, accept others' points of views and to see it and to hear it, acknowledge it, um, and then, you know, find that middle ground to move forward with that. Thank you, Darjane. Um, there, there's one question that I always get, so I'll just address it in case it comes up, is when you start thinking about engaging your employees in DEI work, whether it be through a DEI council, advisory board, ERG, uh, affinity group, um, just be mindful of two things. One is they also have an existing day job most likely they will be more passionate about the DEI work simply because they've already raised their hand. Um, what then tends to happen is invariably it may affect their day job, but that's not, how do I want to say this? Man you don't want their managers to penalize them for their DEI work uh, because it's also helping the organization, but that manager may not care and say, well, you wasted too much time on this council. This job didn't get done. Uh, therefore, I'm not promoting you, right? So now you're back to the same problem that you're trying to solve for, which is people from underrepresented backgrounds doing double work in terms of advancing DNI, but now getting, you know, um, uh, not the not benefiting from the promotion, and now you've suppressed their their uh, career, right? And so the way organizations are doing this is, and again, I recognize there were a, a smaller, uh, you know, not smaller organizations here. Um, you know, some companies are paying their employees a small bonus to do this work, right? Employee resource group leaders are now receiving an annual payment to, to do this work. But budgets are always a constraint, I get it. But in the absence of that, what many organizations have done, and I implemented this in my prior organization, is build that work that they're doing for the DEI uh, strategy into their objectives, right? So if 100% of their work is uh, you know, dedicated towards programming of a certain, uh, you know, area of your nonprofit, carve out 10% and say 10% is for uh, the DEI work, right? Get the leadership buy-in, get the managers to sign off on it. So at the end of the year, they're not getting penalized for the work that they're doing. Uh, and then they can figure out, okay, 10% of my week is four hours. I'm allowed to spend four hours in a week helping drive DEI work, you know, in my organization. So then you are not penalizing them and you're actually rewarding them for that work. And it's purely voluntary, but now you have the managers buy-in as well. So engage your employees, but just be mindful that this doesn't inadvertently then you know affect them in, in, in any other way uh, in other uh, talent life cycles. Oh uh, yeah, I, and I and I like that approach, especially um, as we are trying to um, gain building um, capacity building grants that we are struggling to get. Um, and that is a really good way to get um, employee engagement, um, and so that their work is um, actually valued and shown and so that they're actually getting that credit. So um, we're going to actually look for how we could begin to do that um, as well as our in our organization. 
Okay, so there's a question. Oh, go ahead, uh, Dean. Um, from my experience, when you talk about um, uh, that, that balance between um, uh, DEI work and, and, and one's job, um, I, I've seen folks actually interpret that as a negative because it means nothing to them, you see. And so then that becomes a reason to um, not promote somebody or not give them a raise or, or whatever. Um, it's kind of unfortunate, but, but you know, that's the reality. Um, er earlier when you talked about uh, the 10%, the uh, as you said, um, engineers like to use the term 80-20. And the meaning is that 20% of the effort will get you 80% of the way to your goal. And um, yeah, you, you know, you, you have to decide um, where you're going to put your resources. Um, there's, there's no way around that. You know, there will be some that we cannot impress or save or whatever. So we, we, we just have to uh, move on. Um, and one final thing, when you, when you mentioned, um, uh, about how this works into the recruiting process. Um, if you remember early or some years ago uh, in the, in the uh, uh, HRC's um, uh, corporate equality index, there was uh, uh, when the item first came up about medical benefits for transgender folks. Okay. And I, I was a part of, of our uh, employee affinity group, LGBT employee affinity group. And, and that was a tough sell. That was a very, very tough sell until somebody finally realized, okay, let's, let's couch this in terms of uh, what you said about how people look uh, at a company in, in terms of uh, what, what they're doing socially, okay? Once that statement was made, the light bulb went off and it was a problem. So I think the next year or two, when the amount went up, for coverage, no brainer, no resistance whatsoever. So, you know, it's, it's funny how, how things work. If, if you find that button and push that, that makes a world of difference. Yeah. And I think what we're increasingly finding is that button is so different for every organization, right? Um, and this is why it's so tempting to take some other organization's DEI strategy and just kind of adopt it, uh, you know, as your own and just like, oh yeah, let's just use that template. It's, it'll backfire, right? Because you don't know what your triggers are. You don't know what your internal uh, challenges are, right? So learn from others, but definitely try to build your own, even if it means, like I said, doing three things in one year as opposed to 25 things, mm -hmm. you know, they're yours to build, right? It's, it's yours to own. And I think it's important to recognize what's going to work for you. Um, yeah. There were, the idea about um, you know the one size fits all kind of thing yeah. um, that can make your situation worse. Yeah. If it if it doesn't work out. Right. We we have a lot of chatter in the chat box around around uh, <laughs> belonging. Yeah. Yes. Um, do you want to you want to um, elaborate more on that, Rajiv? Sure. So I'll I'll give the logistical answer really quickly, and then we can have the more kind of discussion around it. So yes, the term uh, DEIB DEBI. DNI, IND, DEI, you know, J -E -I, J <laughs> Jedi. Uh, um, all no, this, this, it, the nice thing is with these acronyms is that it's just continuing to show how this body of work continues to evolve and the various um, levels of uh, ways you can approach it, right? And if you if you if you click on any person that's been doing diversity work for say 15, 20 years and you kind of go back on LinkedIn to their old jobs in the 80s and the 90s, you'll see they were part of Office of the D Office of Diversity, right? Or they were the head of diversity. That, that, that was it back then, right? And so this body of work is so beautifully evolved um, where it's, you know, these, these words are being added. Uh, and so, you know, for those that are not fully familiar, very simply put, diversity is the, the mix or the numbers. Um, inclusion is making that mix work for you in your organization. And then the, the belonging piece is uh, how they feel when that inclusion is actually working, right? Um, so inclusion could be more what you're doing to them in terms of providing that inclusion. And then belonging is really the feeling that they're feeling that the inclusion is working, right? So again, you, there are a million definitions of this around the, you know, the, the internet. Um, Verna Myers, who's a DEI uh, consultant and strategist and now head of Netflix's DEI, you know, she, her famous quote was diversity is being uh, invited to the party and inclusion is, the, you know, being asked to dance, right? So, and then that is kind of also morphed into many different variations. So 
Uh, and now there's the whole equity lens of it, right? Because everything has to be done through a lens of equity. Uh, with a lot of the racial justice work, people are now including the J in this conversation. So, you know, again, I, I would encourage everyone not to get too lost in the letters and the acronyms. Uh, we are famous for acronyms in our societies, um, but just focus on the on the work, right? Focus on getting the job done. Uh, don't get so uh, kind of hung up on these letters, but but try to see if you can incorporate some of what those letters mean into the work itself, right? So going back to my earlier point, don't just focus on the diversity and the recruiting piece, focus on the workplace inclusion. Uh, you know, what are you doing with your managers to help them understand how to treat people from different backgrounds? You know, what to say, what not to say. It, it's, it's a behavior change, right? And that's really where the inclusion lies. A lot of managers want a playbook or a checklist of what to say and what not to say. You know, they want to make it easy, but it's not. It's this, this idea of, I could tell you exactly what is not to say to your current team, but tomorrow when you hire a new person, you won't know what to do, right? So how do you build your own agility? How do you build your own learning journey? Uh, and how do we get better as, as human beings? Uh, that's really the body of work around inclusion within the organization itself, right? And uh, and that and how each of them are going to do that, again, is going to be different. Some people are a little bit ahead of that curve. Some people write to read books. Some people love to watch movies. Some people prefer a speaker. So again, going back to the listening conversation, listening to your employees and your managers about how they want to you know, move the dial on this is gonna be of paramount importance, right? You could bring in a fancy speaker, spend $15,000 on it for one hour, you know, they'll all post about it the next morning uh, you know, on LinkedIn and boom, that work is done, right? They're gonna forget about it. But figure out how can you use your own employee stories to drive that conversation internally. People will share, you know, create listening circles, create courageous conversation circles. Um, and you'll be amazed how much managers can just learn from your own employees. You don't need a TEDx speaker to come in and do a, a whiz bang job for one hour, right? Like learn, listen to your own employees. You, you, you'd learn a million things from the five people that are on your team. So um, I think a lot of that will go into the belonging and the inclusion part of the conversation itself. Rajane, anything to add? No, I think you hit it right on the head. Great. Okay, I'm looking at all the questions that are coming in. Um, I know. If anybody wants to vocally share, please do so while Dajane and I read some of these. Um, I, I want to ask again, this is Cheryl. Um, we need some tools. I, I understand conceptually and cognitively, I get everything you're saying. So I, I was wondering, will you offer any samples, tools, um, demonstrations? Do you have anything you could show us? Uh, just to give a sense that, you know, then I could try to apply some of what I'm learning right away. Uh Darjane, Mihai, Bradley, feel free to chime in here. Um, so we could do one of two things. You know, uh, you all have kind of already kind of met each other. If you if you like what somebody else heard, feel free to reach out to them if they're willing to share. The whole the beauty of this is, you know, we can learn from each other. Um, if you're looking for a specific tool, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or email. I'm happy to, you know, try to answer that as well. The reason why we didn't come with a ready kind of you know, canned deck of tools is because we we don't know where everyone is on this journey, right? And there's no point showing you 20 tools when you're not ready with the first one, right? And I think going back to the earlier comment, uh, and again, to amplify what Deanne said, we're all on this in a different level. So there's there's no point, you know, just stealing somebody else's uh, work and, uh, you know, using it. But yeah, we can happily, you know, share and discuss more offline around templates that might work for you. I don't want to steal it. I'm asking oh, permission. Okay. I'm asking right. permission. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if anyone is willing to share. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, I will say that um, a lot of some of the things that um, I developed and have been working on, um, I had to create, you know, kind of from the ground up to fit our organization and to fit our needs that we have. Um, and a lot of it is using what we currently had, um, some of our majority of our policies, looking at, for example, we um, we're in the process of um, updating a lot of our policies. And for one of them, I would say the bereavement policy is a is a general example of how it was very standard. We gave employees three days, they had to fit, and the person that they could get three days from had to be of this category from their immediate family, and it could only be their, uh, you know, their spouse, partner, their, you know, grandparents, whatever, right in the immediate family terminology. Um, 
But people, <laughs> we're a foster care agency and our our youth don't even live with their biological families. So how could we expect our employees to fit in this siloed model of what an immediate family is? So that's one, literally one example of how we took this policy, thought about who, um, what a family meant, and we expanded it. We expanded the terms. We expanded who they could apply it to. We expanded the fact that three days is not a long time to process and grieve or handle business, um, you know, death certificates, funeral arrangements, if you had wills, like what if it was an extended whatever. And so we took that policy and we went from three days to five days that you could break down into 40 hour increments for throughout an entire year, right? So say you wanted to take three days up front and then you need you wanted to spread out the rest of it. We literally chopped up our old bereavement policy and truly went through it and thought about what it truly meant to lose the loved one and who in that category. And then even if it didn't fit, like maybe you took care of your neighbor. We even considered that you were a close caregiver. Um, and so when we talk about um, equity and we talk about inclusion, what, what does that truly look like in our policy work as well, right? So how does our policy work align with, one, if we're serving clients and what that clientele looks like, but two, how do we fit our needs of our employees? If we know we're a foster care agency um, and we know that they they don't even have their own biological families and make up, even though family first right now, but we know that transitional housing youth, they, they're emancipated. They don't even have their own family. So how could we keep this in a box and in this silo? So that's just like kind of one example of um, where we kind of started from and um, how we kind of applied um, this DNI lens to our current policies and procedures and morph them to be more broader, more inclusive, more equitable in how we determine that it will be used. And so that's something that, you know, you can think of like, what do you currently have and how it's being implemented, but how can you make it broader to include more um, and how it can be um, delivered. And so that a lot of the things that we have done here at Walden is taking what we currently have using our this lens and how we can make it more, how we can expand upon that. Um, and then when it comes to, um, you know, the above and beyond that and the work change and the transitions of that, um, Mary put in a good comment in the chat box, but also it's, a, you know, you have some of the data there. You have surveys, you use your surveys. They really do help pinpoint where your gaps are. Um, do focus groups, talk to the different groups that you're serving, that your employees are at. Um, and, and kind of look at that data, develop data together, right? And so that really helps drive, you know, the direction and, and it helps start the initiatives and where you, you and it pinpoints those gaps um, now so that you can develop that plan um, going forward. Um, and so that's kind of, it's literally from the ground up. If you have, if you ever done a dissertation, it's, it's literally like that, <laughs> you know, that the data analysis, getting that, um, it's, it's, it's just hard. <laughs> it's just hard work. It's, it's, it's not easily prescribed, um, to, to, so what Rajiv was saying, it's, it's really, you know, how does it fit the model and the needs of your organization? That was, that was super helpful. Thank you so much, Darjane. Um, I think we're about to start wrapping up. Um, you know, and again, the chat has been so great. There were a couple of questions that we didn't get to, but I think we can save them and uh, we'll have a record of them and we can try to reach out after the call. But yeah, as we wrap up here, you know, this, this discussion has been more than invigorating and amazing for me. I've learned so much from all of you. Um, and Darjane, thanks so much for, you know, joining as well. Um, you know, as we wrap up again, just to, you know, as, uh, as closing remarks, you know, there's a lot we covered. There's a lot you're probably going to kind of go back and say, we could do this, we could do that. Let's do this, let's do that. And I think the, the, the main thing I'll say is, you know, be intentional about what your organization needs. Listen to your employees, prioritize. And if you think you can do three things in one year, just pick two of those because guaranteed you will get more pushback than you thought. Uh, and so don't overpromise, underachieve, you know, figure out five, do two, it'll be a great win for the year. Um, and then next year you kind of keep building upon that, right? You learn from that. But again, be intentional, focus on the process, not just on one piece of it. Listen to your employees, listen to your uh, communities and your stakeholders uh, and listen and, you know, talk to each other. Uh, this is a great cohort here. I'm sure uh, there's a lot of great um, colleagues and, and uh, you know, partners here. So, you know, we can learn from each other as well. So. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Darjane if you have any closing comments, and if not, to Bradley. 
Um, I do not have any additional closing comments outside of thank you for participating and coming. Um, thank you for being brave enough to share, right? Um, a lot of times we get in this space and we're kind of intimidated to share or we ask, ask questions live or, but um, I just want to say thank you for just being, you know, here, present, sharing and, um, you know, looking for support and trying to figure out how ways to support your organization and employees. And, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll close it out. And yeah, just to Rajiv and Darjane's point, thank you all for uh, attending. As you can see, this really was a discussion, not a lecture or training in, in any sense. So thank you for everybody's input and engagement. And also thank you really to Darjane and Rajiv for really turbocharging this conversation around DEI and adding their unique experiences and perspectives from the work that they have done and are continuing to do in the space. And really adding to that, um, this webinar was a partnership or is a partnership with Walden Family Services as part of our really joint collaboration to support primarily in the empire base, but really mission-driven organizations all, all over um, towards strengthening their commitment to DI. So just again, thank you to Darjane, Mary Frame, and everybody at, at Walden Family Services. And if you're not already familiar with our technical assistance and capacity building services, uh, learn more about our work, which includes these free monthly, sometimes two uh, webinars, master classes, um, circles, and I'll drop the links right now, but feel free to subscribe to our letter and, and follow our social media for any updates on, on new events. And just adding, um, we're able to provide these webinars at no cost, thanks to the generous support provided by um, the Wells Fargo Open for Business Fund, and I'll drop the link as well if you want to read more about that. But yeah, we'll follow up shortly with an email sharing the recording um, and some more information. And with that, just thank you everybody for attending and uh, hope you hope everybody has a great weekend.